Hello and welcome to the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. Today's guest is the CEO and founder of Global Sisterhood, an incredible platform for rising women and a movement of sister circles around the world in over 85 countries, providing space, guidance, and practices for women everywhere to cultivate emotional freedom and live in their power. Her expertise is fueled by her experience of transforming her trauma into service, leading her to the Amazon and into the halls of the UN. Her passion is to help restore the balance between masculine and feminine in the world by helping women collectively shed the wounds of the past and step into a new time of freedom and feminine power. The Global Sisterhood has held over 8,000 women's circles and led globally synchronized meditations with over 60,000 women participating. Welcome to the show, Lauren Walsh. Hey, Hey. (laughs) I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so glad to have you on. Thank you. So I got introduced to you from your team, and then I got to uh, go through some of the stuff of the Global Sisterhood. It seems like you are making a massive impact. I love what you're doing. Um, For those of you who are, for those people who don't know anything about you, why don't you give them a little bit about your background? and all the stuff you're working on, because it's, it's pretty immense. You're doing it on a massive scale. Yeah, it's, it was kind of random, to be honest, that it blew up in the way it did. Um, and one of those stories of kind of accidentally starting a movement and then figuring out what to do with it after that. Um, but basically, my story is one, like many women, I came from a background of abuse and trauma. And with that abuse and trauma, it wasn't just with men, it was also with the way women treated me, or young girls rather, and teenage girls, and the way I developed my self-worth and my self-confidence. It was just very subpar and unhealthy. And so I made really bad decisions. And I made those bad decisions and it hurt like hell. Oh my God, it hurt like hell. And I found myself when I was 21 in this abusive relationship. And I would always, I'd always been a spiritual person always. Like, even though I was making these poor decisions and I was kind of exploring the darkness that I felt in the world and around me and in my family and kind of going out seeking for answers through kind of opening the curtains to what is that dark feeling I feel and kind of going directly there. Even though I was kind of making these decisions to follow this dark path, I still had this intuitive connection to nature And I always saw the world in a different way. I always saw what was around and was like, is this it? I was pretty disenchanted even as a young girl because I I craved this more fantastical world, this more harmonious, united world, one where actually like nature could speak to us and animals could speak to us and we were all connected and we had more than just our, our, our minds to guide us, but there was something bigger connecting us. So even though I was in like this world of like, just like lack of self-worth. I was in Hollywood. I was doing all these silly, silly things. Um, Even though I was there, I was somewhat connected and I was always writing. And at one point I had what I call an intervention from the divine. And this intervention led me to go live in the Amazon. I ran away from this abusive relationship and I immersed myself in nature for, for a good long while. And then later again for six months. And in that process, I had an awakening. And when I say awakening, I don't mean I became spiritually enlightened, but I, all of a sudden my, my consciousness increased and I was able to see in the reflection of the natives there, the illusion that I had been taught, the illusion that somehow my value didn't matter. Somehow I had to be this way or had to be this another way. Like I had to look the whole like young girl trauma of, I have to look pretty. I have to smile at everybody. I have to please. I have to do all these things. I saw for the first time ever in the reflection of these women who were just rooted warriors of the earth, so connected and without extra pleasantries trying to make themselves look better or be liked. I was able to, in that force of their presence and the force of nature, begin to truly see myself. And also see and remember something greater, the potential for something greater. I was able to see a potential for my life and for the lives of others that was greater. And that's what I call my awakening. And that fueled the inspiration to really do a lot of inner work and a lot of inner transformation. 
which is hard as hell, especially when you come from like a really destructive path. Like the awake awakening isn't this easy thing. It's like, ouch, you know, you were in pain before, but when you wake up, you're actually a little bit in more pain, but you're, you're just like, okay, I have to do something about it. And so I had this devotion to actually truly do whatever was necessary to heal my patterns, to be real with myself, to be like, wow, I was dishonest there. Wow. I was manipulative there. Wow. I could have been kinder to myself there. What do I do from here? How do I go forward? So I began a really rigorous, devoted journey of self-work and that self-work led me to work with different teachers, led me to then support young girls specifically that I saw were going through similar things that I endured. And I became a big sister to them helped them through their teen years. And then I began through during that time also working with other women. There was this miraculous thing that happened when I stepped into service that I think is probably true for everyone. When you step into service because your heart truly feels a call and you're working on yourself as well, there's this synchronicity, this magic that takes place. And when I would show up for a woman because I cared and she shared with me what was going on authentically, I would be mesmerized because I was like, wow, I was just working on this like last month. Here's what I'm learning. And I just got to share my experiences and share my journey of learning. And in turn, I started helping others grow. And I found that there was something working through me. There was a voice that was higher than my own. And do you know that experience sometimes when you just show up and you move out of yourself, something else channels through that's a message for somebody else, but also a message for you? I began to live that all the time. And I began to trust in that. And I began to channel this force that led me to becoming a coach and becoming a healer. Uh, that led me to doing all this women's work in communities all around Austin, which then led me to accidentally starting the Global Sisterhood. Um, I can go specifically about how I accidentally started it, but basically I just wanted to... I wanted to help women address something that it wasn't commonly addressed at the time. Now it's more so. I like to think I helped with that. But um, there is this, we, we talk about girls being catty or jealous or whatever. It's like a, a simple way we like, you know, categorize young girls. But what we don't talk about is that what happens when women grow older and they suffer from a lack of self-worth or a feeling of not being enough, that there's this epidemic of comparing ourselves to each other. And this comparing was born from the idea that women are less than and we have to compete to survive, which began a long time ago. And so there is this thread between women of comparing each other and also mis with this lack of mistrust. So there's like the shadow of sisterhood that I wanted to call out. And I did this event. Um, with in tandem with an organization called Unify, where I led a, you know, Unify? Yeah. yeah. Where I, I led a meditation in the Texas state Capitol um, on international peace day. There's about 1200 people there meditating. And then I did a, an event for women right afterwards where I led them through this pledge of sisterhood that we vowed to really work on the shadow component of sisterhood and be like, agents of, true connection between women, safe connection between women. And at that moment, one of the people from Unify, Patrick Cronfley, saw me doing that. It was like, yo, I've never seen women gather in circle before. This has to happen all over the world. And we started collaborating on this one-time event on International Women's Day in 2016. And we launched this event and there were 650 women's circles that took place in over 65 countries on that day doing the same inner work to help build community, build sisterhood in our community so that we could do the healing work necessary to rise into leaders that will innovate our world. And it just took off after that. Wow. That's beautiful. <laughs> A long answer. Well, no, good. I, yeah. I'm glad you gave me the, the background. Yeah. Shout out Patrick. He's been on the podcast and I met him in Austin at the Conscious Media Festival. Really beautiful son of a gun. Nice guy. Um, yeah. You know, it's such a it's such a beautiful story, like to know the background and it's such important work. Um, you know, life is challenging for young people, but I think especially young women and, and that 
yeah, I don't understand it personally, obviously, but uh, I've heard a lot of stories of just like the challenges of women. Like you have to look a certain way, think a certain way. Um, and then a lot of the time, the other women are not supportive. They're kind of no. like have this different mentality. And I hear about some of the stories is like, wait, a person acted like that and did that? I was like, that's so frigged up. Like, what the heck? Um, so maybe you can speak a little bit more about the global sisterhood because I think it's a wonderful idea. And then um, the, the first question that I had is, I think that building self-worth and, and just feeling enough and like the comparison thing is something that everybody deals with, especially mm -hmm. young women. Um, you know, we have these 14-year-olds, 12-year-olds looking around and like just creating these ideas of themselves that they're never going to be. And then they're not mm -hmm. enough if they don't reach that. And it, it is a shedding process. So I'm just curious if you could speak on that. Yeah. Well, it is this, I, this, I call it an epidemic of self-worth, right? The I am not enough epidemic. And it really did. It is a result of a patriarchal system. And when I say patriarchy, I do not mean, I do not mean men. I do not mean men. I mean a hyper masculine system that was created through the idea that our God is a male versus both aspects of feminine and masculine. And so with that masculinity exalted and femininity seen as less than or a weakness or a temptation or, or what have you. So for a long time, a long, long time, masculine qualities were seen as important and valuable and feminine qualities were seen as less than or even you know sacrilegious who knows um and so we built these systems that were production oriented produce 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 grow 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 the survival of the fittest and it lost sight of a really important aspect which is that intuitive, non-linear, mysterious component of the feminine, the emotional component of the feminine, that connected to all component of the feminine that both men and women have. So women being more feminine naturally than men, but not always, not always, um, grew up feeling like they weren't were, they weren't worthy. They weren't worthy of, I mean, they literally weren't. They literally did, didn't have rights for a long time because of how out of balance the system was. And so really women had to compete to survive. They had to be a certain way to be liked by a man, to be accepted by a man. And do I say this is men's fault? I don't. I'm not that type of feminist. I do not believe the men today are responsible for that. I believe men today are victims of that just as women are. And now it's up to us collectively to unwind these patterns that have been instilled in culture and society in ourselves that creates this toxicity that makes keeps men feeling like they can't express their emotions that they have to be a certain way that they're not good enough unless they're these like hyper exalted masculine men and women feeling like they have no voice that they don't matter that they need to be small that they need to please um and so in healing that right? I believe the next step to that is for women to really claim their power. And you see this happening in the rise of feminism. Women are taking charge. And there's another layer to it, which is the emotional freedom from the trauma of it, right? Without anger and without blame, but the emotional freedom to really walk into any room and not have judgment, but to say, oh, I see I see that that man who might be embodying patriarchal trauma and who's being a, a toxic masculine man, potentially, I see his pain. I see he might not see himself. I see himself. I see who he is. And I have an awareness of my feminine power. I know how to work with that man so that he does not impact me that he does not keep me feeling less than, that he does not touch me, that he doesn't keep me from having me, he does not keep me from succeeding, right? So to teach women this type of power, their own power, their feminine power, and to honor that as much as they've learned to honor and exalt their own masculine qualities, to have them really honor their feminine qualities and own them in a way where they can go into boardrooms and honor their intuition and their feelings and voice them. And that 
and voice them in such a way that they're so confident that they're, li- they're listened to. I believe that women can innovate. I believe women are here to actually start to lead and show a new way. And that men, it's not about overthrowing men, it's about men healing as well. And so Global Sisterhood is for that. We have women's circles and we have tools and practices, programs for women to really embody their voice and their power. That's amazing. You said a lot of stuff there um, that I think is really good and we could dive in on probably each one, but I like the idea. It's interesting that I just watched something on Gaia TV and I, I don't know what it was, some ancient civilizations or whatever. And it just talked about the history and before we had uh, uh, mono uh, monotheistic, one God, one male God, before that there's actually apparently many um, female gods and there was like lots of them. And so then, you, then it kind of gave you a timeline through history and then the wars and the crusades and the inquisition and, you know, just like it's countless. How, and that's what we have today, you know, as far as systems go. So, you know, I agree. I don't think it's like men's fault in particular. It's like the energy of the masculine where it can be, you know, competition over collaboration. And, um, and I like the idea of merging masculine and feminine because uh, it's a huge problem for the guys too. Um, when I see like guys are, they don't want to share their feelings. Uh, they always have to be tough. They need to provide. They're equally confused. They don't know how to, they don't know how to handle things. You know, most people are good people and same like women have different issues where you might go into work and you're not being heard the same way. You feel less than because of whatever society is doing to you. And then you have a dick at work who's just like kind of, I don't know, whatever he's doing that's inappropriate or like, or just feels like he's better than, and you have to work with that, that would also be challenging. And so we get to the root of like, what's going on as a society, but what can we do as individuals to get to that state of power? Because if you find that self-empowerment, the obstacles and the challenges outside of you aren't as much, you know, a really Mm -hmm. empowered man or an empowered woman is much stronger and can deal with these things like, uh, you know, that happened because life and people are just the way they are and they're, we're not, we're imperfect. So I would love for you to touch a little bit on um, either more merging masculine and feminine because I think that's a, an important thing and some tools for women to be empowered or like a, a first step because it's like, uh, it's just, it's hard to see when you see somebody like they just, they don't have any value in themselves and they're just, you know, they're just kind of going along, letting people tell them what to do and, and they don't feel like they are worth anything. It's super crappy. So I'm wondering if you could build them up from that, that space. Yeah. Well, not even from that space. I would say the majority of women to some degree have, have less than amazing thoughts about themselves. And that's a symptom of the exact same trauma. There's different, there's different frequencies in the trauma. There's a dial that turns it way up and then there's a dial that turns it way down, but it's the same trauma and it ranges. And this is how you know if you suffer from this trauma as a woman, if you look in the mirror and judge yourself with judge your wrinkles, judge your cellulite, judge your belly, you're affected by it. If you are not speaking your truth and not saying no to things when you actually really need to, to take care of yourself, you're affected by this trauma because you're scared to stand in your truth. You're scared to, you're scared to uh, offend, scared to not, not have people like you. If you are not speaking up at work, if you're making yourself a little bit softer, your voice a little bit softer at work, even if you don't have, if, even if you know your worth to some extent, but you're still doing some of those things, you're impacted by this trauma. So the first step is really to identify where you are leaking your power and what the thought is behind it, what the motivation, motivational, motivational driving thought is. So for instance, I have had a really hard time wanting to be liked. I just want to be liked. I don't want to be judged. I was judged a lot when I was a little girl and I don't like being judged. It, it's kind of the precursor to rejection, right? And then if a whole community is judging you and rejecting you, that's a really big wound. And I think for women, that's a very serious wound because if we were talking about the crusades and all these kinds of things, like I think a lot about the trauma of women forever when they were wise, when they did speak their truth, when they did, you know, peel, peel people and show their power, they were labeled witches if they, if they crossed someone. Yeah, that's actually what I was going to say you covered. It was like the witch burnings. That's actually not that long ago. No, and that's an epigenetic trauma that women experience. I 
I can relate to that feeling, this feeling of like, if they don't like me, they might reject me. Something horrible might happen to me. And it's an irrational fear. It doesn't exist in this time. I'll be fine. I'll be relatively fine if this group of people don't like me, but I can still have that like PTSD nervous reaction to for it. So what I have to explore is how I am giving away my power, the behaviors that I have inside of myself that are acting in a way to prevent people from not having negative thoughts about me. So ways that I'm denying my truth just to be liked, which can be so super small or it can be really, really large. And so when I'm aware of that, then I can start seeing how I'm leaking my energy and I can start claiming my energy back to me by refusing to participate in those kinds of thoughts. Even though often they're a little bit subconscious because they're so ingrained that people have to t- pay close attention. So that means less time scrolling on Instagram and looking at other people and thinking about yourself and taking deep breaths. Right. Well, you touched on a huge one too. Like judgment is one of the fundamental lessons in any Zen teaching. And it's interesting because most people will perceive that as, you know, you go around and others are judging you. And sometimes people judge you is true. Um, But usually, I would say 90% of the time, the individual judges themselves so much harsher than anyone else is is Mm -hmm. judging them as they move through life. So I'm curious if you have any um, insight on just judgment in general and how uh, a person can be a little bit kinder to themselves and even just something for people out there who are judgmental to kind of like drop that. And then the last thing I'll say about that is like, you know, naturally for you guys who are working on judgment and aren't doing it in a malicious way, we do it, we do it naturally. Like we might judge ourselves naturally comparatively just because we want to see where we're at and we're trying to understand a reality. We might judge a person and it might be a negative judgment. That's how our brains operate. Then just let it go. Just don't hold on to it and, and get to what you would prefer and, and uh, where you want to move towards. Just don't stay there. Yeah. I think there's something to be said for the difference between judgment and discernment. And I think to look at someone in an aspirational way, perhaps to be like, wow, what are they doing that I'm not doing that I want to embody? That's discernment or, oh, wow, that person's doing that thing. Oh, I don't want to be like that. That's discernment as long as there's not this emotional, negative, blaming, shaming charge to it, right? And when you were speaking about it, I was thinking about one of my teachers Um, Her name is Clara Lura. She was on the Council of the 13 Indigenous Grandmothers. And she is so funny. Oh, my God. What a wise, hilarious woman. Um, And and I was complaining to her one day about my fear of not being liked and my fear of, of being judged. And she was like, that's because you judge. And I was like, what do you mean? She goes, you're judgmental. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm a kind, loving person. She goes, I don't think so. You are judgmental. I was like, wow, am I judgmental? And I was. I just couldn't even see it because they were judgments that were happening all the time that I wasn't speaking. And I've really had to unwind that in myself because the thing is, if you are judging other people, people are judging you. You're, it's just, it's just, you're emitting this energy of judgment and you will attract that energy back. So the idea is to, you know, you can observe, you can observe and you can learn from other people. You can say, wow, that person's doing something that I really like. Whoa, I'm not doing it that well. Okay. I want to step into it. But the moment that you observe someone else and you shame yourself for not being where they are is the moment you completely fail at actually growing to be that person or be embody that quality that they that they are embodying that you admire. And then on the flip side, when you are judging someone in a negative way and you make an assumption about that person and you label them as such, you, they'll forever show up that way for you because you've branded them that way. And secondly, you're, cre- you're creating this just kind of you're creating a lack of possibility for yourself, for people to surprise you and for the world to surprise you. And I think a lot of people going on the more worldview that are really, really critical of the world and kind of really pessimistic about 
which is understandable with everything going on in the world. I think those people are very, very limiting um, to not only what is possible for in the world around them, but limit they limit themselves to what's possible for themselves. Like that's just a it's just a it's just a mental trick to be judgmental and critical. It's a trap, really. Yeah, I totally agree. And the the thing that I think about judgment too is like you spend all of this unnecessary, unuseful energy in this imagination realm. Like you're imagining someone else judging you and it doesn't matter what they think. They can judge you and that's totally fine. But then the worst part is you think that they're judging you and then you embody that and then you shame yourself and then you're just like, oh God, it becomes this whirl. So yeah, I think the first thing is try not to judge others. Um, try to be kind and compassionate to yourself. There's this awesome Buddha quote says something along the lines that uh, like no one else in the world as much as yourself deserves your uh, love and compassion. And I think that if we can remember to do that as we move forward um, and then also just be that person who is like non-judgmental but cooperative and helpful and supportive, you know, support other people, support other women, support other men. Um, and you will find that support comes your way. And if it doesn't, at least you're showing the example. Um, so yeah, that's what I, I think about when, when we talk about judgment and what I wanted to ask was, what do you see on like a global scale or a societal scale, like some changes in your view that we could make to, um, have the largest positive impact on uh, social change for combining masculine, feminine or women empowerment or people empowerment or anything of that nature? Blame. There is so much blame. Blame, 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 blame everywhere on the internet, everywhere in politics, everywhere. There's left, there's right, there's man, there's woman, there's these polar forces fighting with each other. And I think people are addicted to that. I think people are addicted to that kind of intense blame. And I think blaming, just like judging, just like comparing, is a huge leak of power huge. When you can take self-accountability and stop looking at everything around you and people outside of you to blame for your pain and the way you feel, then you can begin to take your power back and create innovative solutions rather than pointing fingers. And I know that sometimes we need to call it out, you know? And I'm a huge fan of the Me Too movement for that fact. I think calling it out is great. And then it's like, okay, once it's called out, there's the healing. I want to actually go into this a little bit just to explain to especially like some of your male listeners about my perspective on um, what comes after Me Too and how we actually do heal this between men and women specifically. And it's, it's that you have these different, you have these different phases of healing trauma. I know I am an abuse survivor of this of this nature several times over and there's a there's one phase one is feeling like you're a horrible person you don't love yourself you feel a lot of shame phase two if you get to phase two hopefully hopefully you do get to phase two where you continue on you have anger you have anger and that is a necessary necessary phase and so our anger as women is a necessary phase but it cannot be the phase that lasts. The next phase is accountability. Have you seen the Gillette commercial? I don't know which one. Okay, there's one around toxic masculinity (laughs) that everybody's talking about. I haven't seen it yet. I'll look it up. Yeah, look it up. There's this one about toxic masculinity and it's like a big buzzword. You know, this, this, like we're pointing out toxic masculinity, which I think needs to be, needs to be called out. Not because all men are bad, but because our system has promoted it, right? But then we as women need to also then be like, oh, this same system has created toxic femininity as well. If there is such a thing, and I do believe there is, like manipulative, uh, this kind of energy, which I've also embodied in my life. And so really taking self-accountability for what our abuse, even though we were victims of abuse potentially, how that made us, what that made us into. Did it, did it make us into better people? Probably not for a while. But then we took actions based on that that were 
a response to abuse, but after a while, we perpetuate that behavior when there is power to forgive and, and change it, change our own personal behavior. We don't, to forgive is not to condone. To forgive is not to allow. To forgive is not to stay, say, to stay silent and look, look the other way. To forgive is to free yourself from the impact of what happened to you so you can be the person you want to be, make good choices, have love for all, and inspire people to make better choices for themselves. And I feel like in this world today, there are so many people pointing fingers at each other that people aren't spending time in inspiring. And there is a lot of inspiration out there. There is, there is. But I would say we still have a lot more work to do to choose to inspire rather than to blame and to shame and to point out the ugly. That was very well put. I 100% agree with that. Um, you know, that can be the real challenge though to get to like, uh, forgiveness and responsibility because the blame is a natural thing. And so, but from a place of responsibility, then you can have a choice in how you react to the situation, you know? And so if you're in an abusive relationship, you take responsibility for that and you're aware of it, you can end that relationship within that empowerment. Say, you know, it's not right what this person is doing, but from that acceptance of responsibility and say, you know what, I'm going to make another choice now. And then there's going to be another process, but only from, you know, acceptance and responsibility, then you can move forward as a creator to then say, all right, this happened. What am I going to do with it? And I'm reminded of this really intense story that Wayne Dyer shared once. I was watching one of his talks and I really got to remember her name because I've uh, brought it up. I think it's like a, a Evangeli or something. And it's about this woman who survived um, the massacre in, in um, where was it? Where the two tribes came together and they massacred Hotel Rwanda. I don't know oh, if it's like that country. I don't know. Yeah. So basically this girl was in that war and uh, her family, everyone she know got, got murdered and she hid in this bathtub with like 12 other people in a small house for like 30 days and has the most intense story ever. It is so, so intense. And uh, basically she describes getting to a point of like going through all those things, but then eventually getting to like forgiveness and compassion for those who are killing everybody. Yeah, And I'm just thinking like, that is the most extraordinary, intense, wild experience. And I can personally say that I don't think that forgiveness and compassion and acceptance would be my go-to. It would be like, all right, you know, you guys are all toast. And I would go full, like in my mind anyway, Rambo, but that's not, that's not the ideal situation. So, but it wasn't, and she would share, like, it wasn't until she got to that space where she could even consider healing and accepting what had happened this in unthinkable yeah. tragedy. Yeah, no, I, I, I fully agree. And before I comment on that, you know, you, you made this reference about relationships, excuse me. You made this uh, comment about relationships and leaving these bad relationships. And I just want to say that there's some people that can't leave because it's not safe for them to leave. They have to really take a long time to figure out how to leave. So I just wanted to like really honor that component too. There's some people in situations that they can't get out of. Um, and then back to the forgiveness piece, you know, it's not easy. It's not the first natural instinct, especially when you have a tremendous loss or you witness something horrific. But I have a practice that it took me years to get to, but now I when I hear of a murder or something hor horrible like that, I not only send prayers to the, or the, the person, the victim, but I also send prayers for the, the one who committed the crime. Because to commit something so atrocious, you're completely twisted inside because of trauma. Like it's a wound that festered, that didn't get compassion, that didn't get love, and it really took hold of you. And that is something that as a society, we just try to eliminate rather than rehabilitate. Yeah, I think those are really amazing points. And um, the forgiving the abuser um, side of it, I remember, I know you worked with a little bit um, indigenous people and... Uh, I remember reading this 
this thing about if there was a crime committed in the communities in some of the native communities where they would they would basically give healing to the person who was abused but they would also send help to the person who did the abuse and it makes perfect sense you know people who are brought up and have you know good lives you know there might be a very very small percentage of people who are like sick some sort of mental uh, issue where they go around causing harm. That's very, very rare, but more than likely they were severely abused. Something happened to them to make them the way that they are, to think that the way that they think. Like if you look at um, the States right now, um, I just watched Black Klansman and the shocking thing at the end of that movie was um, showing the rallies of the KKK now. You know, that person, yeah. if you just take a kid, doesn't automatically come out racist. You know what I mean? He got, they have to be built that way. Totally. You know what I mean? And so cultures and people and conditioning and traumas make them that way. And with that full understanding, um, you can move forward with a little bit more perspective um, and space and, and, and yeah, just a little bit more space, a little bit more perspective because it's not easy. It would be the hardest, especially if it's, if it's you're the one it's happening to and it's happened to. Yeah, I agree. I fully agree. Um, well, I want to honor your time. I know you got a busy day. I'm going to throw a couple more things at you so you can just take what you wish um, and speak as long as you wish. I know you're busy. Um, you have an event coming up. You should speak about that. Yes. Um, I was curious about, and, and I was just curious about um, you studying with the Native American indigenous people are there. Maybe, I don't know if there's South America, if there's any other lessons that you would want to like share and just a message to you know, women in general, young women, old women, or people in general, if you have any kind of message for them. Mm, I want to ponder one of my lessons from the work I've done with my indigenous grandmother elders. And yeah, I think, I think the main message, the main message there with them, <laughs> with one of them in particular is, is around thinking too much about yourself. Don't, don't think too much about who you are, what, what people think of you. You know, it just, just show up to be helpful, show up to be in service. And in that process, there is a miraculous thing that happens. And that doesn't mean martyr. That does not mean martyr. It means like follow the heart. And in following the heart, a, a pathway opens that leads you to purpose. And that pathway also heals you of your own pain and your own trauma. So following the heart, following just wanting to be in service really does, really does change your life and then ultimately changes the world. So if we're all doing that together, if we're all doing that together, then we can create a better world. And that is not some kind of like idealist notion. That's a fact. That's a fact. If we're all doing the work we need to examine our consciousness, examine our faults, heal our own, you know, cruelty to ourselves and to others, however subtle that cruelty may be, which could be a simple judgment, um, we are going to create a safer, more harmonious place. And so a step in that direction is on International Women's Day. Uh, we're having, Global Sisterhood is having an event on March 8th. It's our fourth annual global event. And it is awesome. It's always awesome. And when I told you that story of how we launched, we had 650 women's circles gather in over 65 countries. Since that day, we've had over 8,000 women's circles happen. And on this International Women's Day, we're calling out to all women and we're asking you to gather in circle. So if you are a woman listening to this and you've never been in a circle, don't worry. We have a 20 page guidebook that tells you exactly how to lead a woman's circle and it's completely free. We think women's circles are the key to really learning how to honor your voice and honor your power, creating safe and sacred space for women to interact with each other, to reflect to each other our truth from like that darkest, scariest truth to that highest, most glorious truth and that whole spectrum to be accepted and to see yourself reflected in the women around you. And a circle can consist of simply three people. And we're doing a live broadcast, which we hope is the largest woman's meditation in history. We had a meditation in 2017 that had 60,000 women involved. And this broadcast will be a meditation on feminine freedom and what that actually means. And that doesn't mean just women's freedom. It means feminine freedom, feminine freedom in the systems to innovate and create social change, feminine freedom in men and women, and what that will do for our world and how we women 
are the pillars of that change. And that all begins with us truly cultivating our own inner freedom. And we'll have a panel discussion on this and it's going to be a beautiful experience. So go to freethefeminine.org to sign up and we will send you everything you need to know. Amazing. Sounds awesome. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your work and I, and I think that is so important. I definitely resonate with that message and I would just love to see, you know, men, women, everyone just being nice to each other and we are different, you know, in our ways, but you know, women empowering women, men empowering men and then merging the feminine and masculine like within ourselves and within our culture so yeah. that we have real inner freedom, outer freedom collaboration, support, being around people who support you, who care about you. aren't. It's like this crab in the bucket thing. You know, we're going out there and it's when it's competition, you need a shield and a sword to block people off and stab them. When really in society, we should be supporting and encouraging and helping. And that would be a really beautiful day. And I think that what you're doing is, is a step in that direction and very, very important. So thank you for everything you're doing. Mm, thank you. I value the work you're doing too. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, have a great day and thanks everybody for listening. Bye.